Now, our speaker for today, as you know, is Dr. Sarah Teichman. She is the head of cellular genetics and senior group leader at the Wellcome Sanger Institute. She did her PhD at the MRC Laboratory of Molecular Biology, or LMB, at Cambridge, and is a Beck Memorial Fellow at UCL. She started a group at the MRC LMB in, 20, in 21, um, 2001, and in 2013, she moved to the Wellcome Genome Campus in Hingston, Cambridge, where her group was a joint between the EMBL European Bioinformatics Institute and the Wellcome Sanger Institute. Dr. Teichmann is an EMBO member and a fellow of the Academy of Medical Sciences. And her work has been recognized by a number of prizes, including the Lister Prize, Biochemical Society Colworth Medal, the Royal Society Crick Lecture, and the EMBO Gold Medal. And most recently, Dr. Teichmann was elected as a fellow of the Royal Society in 2020. So now without further ado, let us welcome Dr. Sarah Teichmann to, de to deliver the talk, Human Cell Atlas, Mapping the human body one cell at a time. Dr. Teichmann, please. Thank you, Saisok, for having me this evening. Um, it's a pleasure to be with you, kind of, even if it is virtual this year. Um, so, the human body, um, looking at human tissues one cell at a time, is what my research is about. And of course, as you know, um, we have many different uh, organ systems in our body, different organs and about 50 roughly or so different tissues. And each of these tissues, for instance, the upper airway, the nose, the lower airway, the, the parenchyma of the lung, consists of different combinations of cells arranged in particular architecture in the tissue. Also the thymus that you can see here and the heart. Um, of course, every cell in our body contains the same DNA. Um, and um, on the left-hand side, you can see a bunch of fibroblasts, which are cells that contrib contribute to the structure of our tissues. And they contain exactly the same DNA as the neuron on the right-hand side, but the, the cells look very different and have very different functions. So what's the difference? The difference is that there's an invisible machinery that transcribes the genes into mRNA and makes proteins um, that controls a different subset of genes being switched on in the fibroblast compared to the neurons and that then leads to phenotypic differences between the cells. And of course for, for over a century we've been looking at cells using microscopes and um, that's incredibly powerful to understand the morphology of cells and a, a subset of the molecules inside it. Over the past decade or so, or, or yeah, slightly more than a decade, uh, there's been a resolution revolution in genomics that's brought us the technology of single cell genomics. And single cell genomics is even better than a microscope in the sense that we can look at or interrogate individual cells in a highly high throughput multiplex manner and um, isolate the nucle nucleic acid content of hundreds or even thousands of single cells and then sequence the content to determine the transcriptome, in other words, the subset of genes that's active in every single cell um, by analyzing the data computationally. And it's really that resolution revolution in genomics for suspension cells and also spatial methods that's been at the heart of the Human Cell Atlas International Consortium. The Human Cell Atlas aims to create a comprehensive reference map of the types and properties of all human cells as a basis for understanding, diagnosing, monitoring, treating health and disease. And to get a, a, a description of the, the cell states and the cell types in those 37 trillion cells that make up the tissues in our body. So the history of the Human Cell Atlas goes back to 2016 when Aviv Regev, uh, who was then at the Broad Institute and is now at Genentech, um, and I got together and um, organized a meeting in London that was really um, the, the, the kickoff uh, of a consortium that now contains over 2,000 members. Actually, this slide is slightly out of date. 
from 71 different countries, a thousand research institutes. So this is basically a grassroots network of scientists working together to map the human body. And you can join, everybody can join by signing up at humancellatlas.org slash join HCA. Um, where you'll be in this network, you can register as an individual scientist, you can register with a particular research project to, to um, interrogate cells in human tissues and um, receive updates via newsletters and um, reagent discounts and so on and so forth. Um, as, a, as a community, uh, we, wanna, we want to achieve this ambitious goal, but we want to also get there and, and um, uh, move on that journey in a way that embraces equity and diversity. And that applies to both the, the samples that we study and the scientists that are involved in the project. And so we have a, a, an equity and diversity working group. We also have working groups that focus on individual um, organs and tissues. And um, you can see some of the, the, the working groups that are um, that have nucleated in the in the consortium here, uh, ranging from the lung, which was the first one, the study of the airways, and that was catalyzed by the COVID-19 pandemic, which I'll come back to later, as well as many other systems, nervous system, liver, gut, immunity, etc., including human development, so embryonic and fetal development organoids. In other words, how can we learn from the human cells for regenerative medicine and genetic diversity? And these uh, networks and their coordinators are listed at humansalatlas.org slash coordinators. So the technologies, and I've mentioned how important these, these were before, um, that have really, um, uh, as I said, sort of catalyzed this project are the combination of single cell and spatial genomics. And if we, we were at a, a point before where we needed hundreds, thousands or more cells for bulk genomics in order to, um, to be able to sequence, to get enough DNA or RNA from a sample to do the, the sequencing. Um, it's, it's that resolution re revolution that's allowed us to go down to the minuscule amounts of nucleic acid inside single cells um, that allows us to, to essentially make this a census of cells in a sample um, using suspension single cell genomics. And more recently, over the past, I don't know, five years or so, um, it's been a rapid advance in spatial genomics methods that come basically through a combination of imaging and, and sequencing technologies that allow us to put these pieces of fruit back together into the tissue microenvironment of the, the fruitcake here. So how, how does the suspension single cell genomics work to isolate and then sequence individual cells where there are different approaches for um, uh, Um, there are different approaches for, for cell isolation. One of them is to actually capture each single cell inside microfluidic chambers. And you can see that here in this little video where we have these little yellow balls being trapped in individual chambers. These are the cells. They're trapped in microfluidic chambers and they go on. Another approach is droplet microfluidics. Other approaches are split seek methods. So there are many different ways of making sure that each cell the, the nucleic acid content of each cell is barcoded specifically um, so that you can deconvolute the data or assign the data to each cell when it comes off the sequencer. Um, it, this is a very easy to understand sort of principle where the cell is trapped in the chamber and then each individual cell is lysed and um, the RNA for, for RNA sequencing in this case is reverse transcribed. So we've got the cell here. Um, it's lies so that the nucleic acid content is released. Um, and then reverse transcription can take place to make cDNA. And then um, uh, primers or uh, uh, barcodes are added and so on for each single cell so that they, are then, it, they can then go off for sequencing. OK. So it's that, that's an example of one of the many technologies that contributes towards this. So really, all together, what we're aiming towards is, is to make a Google map of the human body where we're going from this kind of Google continents or Google countries view 
down to uh, ultimately making a Google Street Maps of the human body. So to achieve that kind of resolution. And, and the, it's the combination of the single cell genomes with spatial methods integrated computationally that will allow us to define the individual cells at whole transcriptome uh, level of detail in terms of their positions in tissues. Now, um, what is the impact of making an atlas like that at that level of why would we want to know that level of detail and the, the spatial component for every single cell in the body? Well, it's because it actually has a lot of implications. Uh, so understanding and knowing ourselves and understanding tissue architecture at that level of detail has implications for disease mechanisms, drug discovery, drug toxicities, um, diagnostics, uh, genetic variants, and then regenerative biology, and ultimately uh, regenerative medicine. And uh, it's really these implications uh, uh, that, that have spurred a lot of the excitement of funders to, to invest in this. So it's, it's partly a basic science discovery-driven project, um, but in the long term, uh, the, 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 the hope is that there'll be a lot of translational um, outcomes. And I'll show you two, two examples of this. One is disease mechanisms, and I'll be focusing on COVID-19, and the other is in regenerative biology. So where does the consortium stand today? This is, this is kind of a quick snapshot of the number of uh, single cell transcriptomes, so suspension cell data, for, for a bunch of different organs, uh, the kidney here, three quarters of a million cells from um, uh, 60 different individuals and over 100 samples, the skin, the lung, the colon, human development, and, uh, and the liver, and so on. So you can see that for each of these, we're getting uh, uh, on, on the order of millions of data points um, to create that Google Street Maps. So I'll start off with an example, a vignette of a cell atlas of a tissue. And what I'll use for this is the human uterus. And it's a particularly exciting one because it's a dynamic tissue. And so it's, um, it, it changes every month uh, going through the, the menstrual cycle. And there's a proliferative stage uh, where the, the tissue is getting rebuilt after it's shed. And then a secretory stage where the epithelial cells secrete nutrients and so on that are needed for the embryo to implant before the end of the cycle. So there's these different stages. Um, there's also uh, a fundamental um, uh, differences in the architecture of these tissues between primates and rodents. And of course, rodents are um, the sort of mammalian model organism of choice for a lot of cell biology and molecular biology. Uh, whereas studying directly in the human is much more difficult because of tissue access. And uh, for, for the, that combination of re reasons, so the dynamic nature of the tissue and the fact that it's human specific, it's uh, uh, because uh, mice don't menstruate basically, um, the, the tissue is quite poorly understood and there's a lot of um, uh, new insights into uh, tissue architecture, cell biology, um, and, and so on to be gained from a cell atlas of the uterus. And this is work by an incredibly talented young investigator at Sanger, Rosa Vento Tormo, who started off as a postdoc in my group and now has her own independent research group. And she spearheaded this project. So um, what we used uh, in, the, in this project was a combination of um, single cell and single nuclear transcriptomics combined with spatial transcriptomics where we're using 10x genomics Visium chips to actually map the transcriptomes of a tissue sections at 50 micron resolution. So what you're seeing over here on the, the top right and uh, in these little um, vignettes is uh, a, a tissue cut through, um, basically like this from, from top to bottom. So you've got the, um, the, the top layer is the endometrium, and then where you see these muscle-like cells in this diagram is the myometrium, which is the muscular layer that surrounds the uterus. And um, um, basically, this is, this is sort of showing the different phases, like I showed you before, of the endometrium um, and of the menstrual cycle. And the, the, the differences in depth here are differences in biopsies between 
um, that are taken from, from living donors who have biopsies for diagnostic purposes that are just a few millimeters in depth where you're getting the upper layer or the internal layer of the, um, of the endometrium versus organ donor biopsies where we get the full thickness uh, across the, the full thickness of the uterus for, into the myometrium, which gives us a kind of complete picture of the, the full depth of the tissue. And we're very fortunate to work with colleagues who, uh, who provide us with these different types of biopsies. And in Cambridge, it's the Cambridge Biorepository for Translational Medicine, uh, led by Kaurar Syed Parsi, that allows us to access these um, biopsies and the generosity of Cambridge uh, deceased transplant donors. That means that we can study these human tissues. So um, kind of back to these tissue sections. So these tissue sections are cut uh, from, from the biopsies that are taken from different phases of the menstrual cycle. So these are luteal phase here, um, which is the, that, that late secretory phase that comes after the proliferative phase. And um, what we're plotting here in the color scale from yellow to dark red is the, um, the gene expression level of genes that mark uh, gl glandular epithelial cells. So this is a particular type of epithelial cell that's secretory. And um, what you can see in, this, in these little dots is that they're individual barcoded features that are 50 micron in, in resolution. And we, we are coloring each individual dot according to the expression level of the module, that the, the genes that mark that cell type. And so we can tell here at 50 micron uh, voxels in the tissue section where those cells are, are, are present. And so you can see that those glandular epithelial cells are present um, basically throughout the, the endometrial zones. Now here, if we look at the, the module of genes that marks us these um, decidual fibroblasts, um, decidual stromal cells, which is a particular fibroblast subpopulation, then you can see that they're particularly highly expressed and, and abundant in the upper, in the inside layer of the endometrium that's um, basically close to the lumen, to the, to the inside of the endometrium at the top, at the top of the, the tissue. Um, yeah, if you're kind of thinking about it in the, the myometrium being at the bottom and the, the lumen, the inside being at the top. And um, if we look at uh, um, a, a different fibroblast population, so these the, then that that corresponds to basal fibroblasts. Then we can see that here in this tissue section, they are restricted to the um, to the the boundary between the myometrium and the endometrium. And then uh, uh, ciliated epithelial cells, which are epithelial cells that contain cilia and are present in the in the lumen. Um, they are they are uh, they are basically where we expect them to be lining the. Um, the, the top of the endometrium here. And LGR5 is one of the markers of those cells, which is interesting because it's also present, it's a gene that's also present on um, intestinal stem cells. So what's exciting about this technology is what you're seeing here is essentially the uh, definition or um, mapping of a tissue by reading out the transcriptomes um, in, in 50 micron features on uh, consecutive sections. Now, um, that's spatial transcriptomics by sequencing. Let's, let's look at an example of spatial transcriptomics by imaging. If we zoom in to the endometrium um, using multiplex single molecule fish, where we're marking different genes with different uh, fluorescently labeled oligonucleotides, then we can actually get to a higher level of resolution. If we zoom in down here, um, into a small field of view where we can actually see the, the precise, almost qu quantify the number of transcripts in single cells. And this is work done by Kenny, Kenny Roberts, a very talented postdoc in Omar Bayraktar's group, who's sort of uh, refined this technology um, to, to achieve this level of uh, these beautiful images that are so high resolution and so quantitative. And what you can see here is that um, the epithelial cells, so I told you about those glandular secretory epithelial cells and then the ciliated epithelial cells, they're marked by EPCAM in, in, the, in the light blue, in the turquoise, DAPI is marking the nucleus in dark blue, 
And then we've got two different um, epithelial cell markers, MMP7 and PAP in red and green. And the green one is marking um, the, the, secretory, um, the secretory cells. And you can see that the, the secretory cells are sat in the, in the late proliferative phase. They're starting to, to sit inside those round, puffy glands um, that, are, that are making the secretions. And, um, and then in mid-secretory and late secretory, they start breaking up again. And um, uh, uh, the, the MMP7 largely dominates in, in the lumen, kind of at the top layer, and, and in the late, in the, the mid to late proliferative and late proliferative, and then PA, PAP7 sort of takes over. So you, what I'm trying to uh, get across to you here is that if we take imaging technologies where we're imaging multiple genes at the same time in single cells, then we can learn something slightly different compared to the the transcriptomics that you saw on the previous slide that, that's mapping all genes at the same time and giving us very deep information in that sense, but it's not quite at this level of individual cells at this point in time. So this is basically the, the human in vivo cell atlasing of endometrial tissue. Um, what about, can we use that information to learn how to engineer an endometrium and make it in a dish, kind of bioengineer tissue? Well, um, Margarita Turco in the pathology department uh, has, has um, pioneered endometrial organoids, and um, she worked with Rosa Bento then in establishing organoid cultures and using the information from the... Um, from the in vivo cell atlas to refine those organoid cultures and make different versions of organoids that correspond more to, to the secretory cells and more to the ciliated cells. So it's basically, we're connecting um, the, the, the um, uh, what we measure basically in the body to something that we, we, we can dream about and, and engineer in the dish. So, you know, this links to what I told you about the implications that the human cell atlas has for regenerative medicine and, 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 um, and also for, for making research reagents in vitro. And that is that um, we can use the information from the human cell atlas to, to engineer and improve in vitro systems because the human cell atlas gives us a kind of recipe for how to make things in a dish because it tells us on each cell what are the cell surface receptors? In other words, what are the signals that that cell is receiving from its neighboring cells using that its spatial transcriptomics uh, data that I showed you? And it also tells us about what the factors, the transcription factors, for instance, are that are cell intrinsic inside each cell that are required to make the cells in the different lineages. So in the case of the epithelial compartment, the... Um, those secretory versus ciliated cells, in the case of the fibroblast, the stromal compartment, it's those luminal versus basal cells um, that make up the different zones. And so, um, so basically that's just a short vignette to, this is unpublished work, but it's just an example to show you how uh, the in vivo cell atlas can inform in vitro systems and help us to engineer tissues in a dish for regenerative uh, medicine and um, and and interrogate uh, mechanisms in cells, um, uh, and and this links to the the endometrial uh, mapping. Basically, links to earlier work that we did, where we mapped the maternal fetal interface. In other words, where the placenta meets the the decidua, and um, one one of the things that we were able to do there was to understand how. The, um, the maternal immune system tolerates the paternal antigens at the maternal fetal interface. So this is taking uh, placental tissue where the, the placenta, of course, contains uh, half of the alleles are from the mother, half of the alleles are from the father, and it's sitting on top of that endometrium, the decidualized endometrium that I just showed you, which contains the maternal immune system because that's obviously completely maternal tissue. And under normal circumstances, our immune systems reject any, um, any antigens that are presented that are, that are foreign, that are non-self, 
And so what we are able to do in this work is by atlasing that interface between the placenta and the decidua, um, we are able to show that there are maternal NK cells that are, um, instead of being having a killer-like phenotype, there are a lot of mechanisms that lead them to have immunosuppressive innate and, and adaptive features that allow them to tolerate the, the trophoblast cells in the placenta. So um, I'm going to move on now from the, the uterus to, the, to the, the respiratory system and uh, move to a story where we asked whether there are differences between healthy and asthmatic tissue in the bronchi, in the human airways. So this is a, a picture of a human lung. You've got trachea, you've got um, the, the bronchi, the large generations, all the way down to the teeny tiny airways ending in the alveoli. And of course, the, the cell composition of these different sizes of airways changes and the alveoli are, are different again. And um, what we did was to map the, um, the bronchi and the alveoli and then uh, compare bronchi, bronchial biopsies that were gathered from uh, uh, um, uh, colleagues in, in the Netherlands to compare the asthmatic to the um, healthy control biopsies. And uh, the bronchi in asthmatic, of course, become tightened, uh, air gets trapped in the alveoli, which leads to an asthmatic airway attack. And so um, the, way, the way we set up this study was to take, um, to take these pinch biopsies basically from the, um, where the, the bronchi divide in the third to the sixth generation, and then to, to, to take the parenchyma from uh, deceased transplant donor tissue. So there are two different types of tissue, again, um, biopsies and deceased transplant donor tissue, as in the case of the endometrium that I mentioned before. And then in this case, um, we're using um, uh, microfluidic droplet technology from 10x Genomics. So this is different to those microfluidic chips that I showed you before. So instead of trapping the cells in individual chambers, here cells basically meet um, meet droplets and get, encapsul or get encapsulated by oil and water droplets together with, with uh, enzyme reagents. Um, and, and, and that's how the individual cells get barcoded. The cDNA gets barcoded. So it's a slightly different principle, different microfluidic principle to the chambers. And um, what that data allowed us to define was um, different epithelial cell populations. And one thing that I should also mention that, that I'll come back to later, that in this same study, we also studied nasal epithelial biopsies. So, so we looked at the upper airways, the nose, and then the bronchi and the alveoli all, all the way down. And um, in the nose, we found these two different uh, goblet cell types which we simply called one and two. And one of the cell types was much more, had a much more inflamed and activated phenotype that suggested that it was uh, sending signals to talk to T cells and, and, and other immune cells, basically in the, um, in the tissue. And um, what we came, what we found out later, so we published this last year before the pandemic hit us. And then we went back to this data in February um, when, when the SARS-CoV-2 uh, virus kind of landed on these shores and um, uh, we, we wanted to understand in more detail where the virus was entering the cells in our body. And that's that precise cell type, that goblet cell type that we kind of described as the more immune active cell type also has higher levels of the SARS-CoV-2 receptor ACE2. And so then that, that, um, that realization sort of led to a, a larger project where we asked how uh, all the human cell atlas data can um, allow us to predict where the virus is entering the cells in our body. And so this was a massive consortium effort where many, many people rapidly, very rapidly got together from around the world in, in that lung biological network that I mentioned earlier, but also contributing um, not just airway, but data from other tissues, um, including data that was unpublished. And so that was kind of quite an incredible, uh, you know, realization for the scientific community that in the case of um, a public health emergency like the, the COVID-19 pandemic, we are able to get together and share data um, essentially overnight if we need to. 
And it was really the, the, the Human Cells Consortium and the network of hundreds of scientists that were connected by email, by Slack channels, by, um, um, by other electronic um, and, 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 and media and so on that we were able to work together so quickly and, um, and then and, and share the data. And then it was a, a postdoc word on Sungnak and uh, Ni Huang a staff scientist my group who brought it together and integrated and analyzed it. And so we're able to ask where ACE2 is and the, the other viral entry receptors in, um, in these tissues that you can see uh, uh, around the human body, including the barrier tissues on the left and then internal tissues roughly on the right. So on the, on the left-hand side here, you can see the nose, the bronchi and um, and the, the alveoli, and on the right-hand side, uh, other barrier tissues in the eye, the gastrointestinal tract, and at the maternal fetal interface. So I've mentioned the nose already that we found that goblet cell population that's very high in, in the ACE2 receptor. And that was um, sort of really exciting and interesting at that point back then, um, half a year ago, because it, it wasn't really understood mechanistically why this transmissivity of this virus is so high because if it's only sitting down inside the, the parenchyma, then like in the alveoli, so it was known that, that alveolar type two cells have the receptor already for, for other types of coronavirus, but uh, that was described back in 2004. But um, uh, that, doesn't, that doesn't really, uh, that's kind of deep down in the airways and it doesn't explain the high transmissivity. So the, um, the bronchial, the nasal and the bronchial presence of cells that have ACE2 was really um, more relevant in terms of understanding transmissivity than the later pathology of the disease that leads to the acute respiratory distress and the, the, um, the damage in the lung. Uh, Linda Lako's group from, from um, uh, Newcastle shared her eye, her unpublished eye data at that time, and, and that allowed us to see that there were superficial conjunctival cells, so this is in the white of your eye, um, that have high ACE2 and Tempras2 expression, and, and that can explain uh, some of the, the viral conjunctivitis and also implicate the nasal lacrimal duct in, in transmission of the virus. In the gut, um, we and others saw that there were enterocytes that had high expression of the receptor, and of course, um, uh, kids often have diarrhea. We now know that these cells are sat in both the small intestine and the large intestine, and, and are present basically throughout the gut. And, and so that um, implicates the, the oral fecal route of transmission of the virus and contributes probably to the high transmissivity. Now, all those tissues are relevant for horizontal transmission from one person to another person. And for vertical transmission, what's relevant is the maternal fetal interface. Um, so the placenta and the decidua that we've discussed before and what we show is that there are perivascular and stromal cells on the maternal side of the uh, decidua, the endometrium, in the pregnant state um, that may potentially link to uh, trophoblast cells that have the, the viral entry factors on the fetal side. And this hypothetically can be a route of transmission vertically from mother to fetus, which is obviously very, very rare, thankfully. Um, but uh, it does happen, and the human cell atlas data here proposes a mechanism for how that could happen. So using those examples of the, the COVID-19 mapping of the viral entry receptors, which the human cell atlas consortium is now following up with analysis of uh, uh, infected tissue and infected blood, uh, blood from infected patients, and the earlier example of the endometrium in vivo and relating that to the endometrium in a dish, I hope you have some uh, little tastes for how the human cell atlas can, can also have relevance for, for translation and medicine and not just for basic understanding of discovery of our cells and knowledge of our cells. I've talked about um, the, the, the endometrium, the uterus and uh, the placenta human, from, from human development. And I've talked about um, the airways in the adult, um, giving you an insight into some of the tissue maps that we've made in this project. Thank you for listening. I will stop there and take questions. Uh, 
Thank you very much, Dr. Sarah Teichman, for your insightful talk about the Human Cell Atlas project. I think it's really interesting that we can that um, the stories that you've shared about how it can be used in regenerative medicine as well as this current COVID-19 pandemic. So we'll now open the floor to Q&A. Um, I'm sure everyone has lots of questions, but um, probably due to time limit, could you just limit to one question first? And if there's still time left, we could have a second or third question. Please fire away if you have any questions. Hi, I'm Constantine. I would like to uh, know more about the spatial transcriptomics and uh, like how high resolution can be achieved there. Like, can you go down to like within cell, like subcellular resolution with the single cell transcriptomics data? So with the sequencing, um, there is a paper uh, on, on a technology called SlideSeq that reports down to two micron resolution, which is subcellular. Um, if you think about a eukaryotic cell, that's about 10 microns in diameter. Um, and so, so I think that in the future that will be a routine. At the moment, that's not a, a like implemented routinely uh, in a kitted sense, but um, I think in the future it will be possible. And of course, with the with the imaging based methods, that's definitely the case. So there, I didn't talk about that in detail, and I only showed you this fourplex imaging, but there are also uh, plexities that go up to a hundred or even a thousand genes using imaging technologies, and they are definitely at um, at subcellular resolution. Thank you. Could I ask a question? Sure. One of the, uh, thank you for a very informative talk. One of the key debates in medicine at present is the type of inflammation which is going on in the lungs of people with COVID-19. Um, are you saying your uh, technique can define that well if, uh, say, bronchoscopies are done on patients with this type of infection? Yeah, so I think that's, um, um, I mean, it's it's totally, when you say type of infection, I mean, what the, what the, the cell atlas data tells us is, um, you know, what types of cells are infiltrating into the tissue and um, also which types of cells have viral reads if you're doing single cell transcriptomics. So you can define both the human reads, but also the viral reads, obviously, in every single cell. And for... Um, for infected tissues in the airways, what we're getting is nasal scrapings um, from patients, uh, both symptomatic and asymptomatic, and um, um, uh, tracheal and bronchial alveolar lavages. So it's the, the tissues that are shed um, from patients that are intubated, so, so quite severe uh, infected patients. And, um, and, and there you, you get both epithelial cells, but also immune cells. And so you can tell, um, uh, you know, a fair amount about the infected cells as well as the immune response. And then, of course, from the, from the deceased COVID-19 patients, we're getting uh, autopsy material and their efforts underway in, in the US and in the UK. Um, and, and it's including at Sanger, to analyze the to analyze uh, tissues from autopsies, um, including lung tissue, and in fact, I can dig out some slides uh, of that and and basically profile that that sort of final end stage of the disease. Thank you. Hi, can I just ask a question? Yeah, um, so regarding single cell transcriptomics, um, I was just wondering, it has 
currently you've mentioned a lot of applications, but do you think what do you think are some of the limitations for um, single cell transcriptomics, which currently perhaps maybe technologically or um, something that's inherent to a technique, which we might not be able to figure out and we might need to use other techniques? So I think that, um, you know, what your colleague asked before about the, the subcellular resolution is a key one, quite a, a big one. So it's basically, um, you know, capturing the whole transcriptome, epigenome and so on. Uh, at subcellular resolution or, or transcriptome um, and and so it's the the in in space it's the resolution and also the z the depth right because at the, the moment it's it's the tissue section in two dimensions as I showed you that you're that you're getting so you're getting the x and the y but you have to reconstruct the z by taking consecutive sections and, and so, you know, those are technical limitations. And then in terms of what you're measuring, um, that's another axis that's kind of developing very rapidly uh, in the sense of multi-omics technology. So I didn't talk about that so much, but where you can actually measure multiple features from the same single cell. So the DNA, the epigenome, the RNA, the protein, and so on, using antibodies, using oligonucleotide linked antibodies. And, um, that's another kind of technical area and a technical challenge. And that's developing very quickly in the suspension cell domain that you can measure multiple layers kind of from the same single cell in suspension. Um, but that in, in space, so to speak, in the spatial um, sequencing, spatial genomic side of things, that multi-omics is, is lagging and is yet to come. So it's really the, I think the... Um, yeah, the, the three dimensions, the resolution, and the multiple phenotypes from the same single cell. So also following up on that question, um, in terms of, because well, probably one of the applications of single cell is that you're able to split um, cell groups into finer and finer um, groups. So at, at what point would you consider them to be similar cells? And at what point would you consider them to be different cells, for instance, about the the, the goblet cells which you've mentioned, um, how would you tell whether are they actually just two cells which are similar or they're two distinct groups? Mm -hmm. Great question. So there are two answers to that. One is um, that we can, we can use a computational or statistical criteria for defining when a, um, a, trans, a, a set of uh, data from, from different individual cells is, is coherent kind of, um, and we use, um, I mean, we have a paper that basically shows how you can use just iterative clustering and then cross-matching between different clusters to define the point at which the data can be modeled robustly in terms of, of transcriptomic data um, in individual clusters and the point at which you can't distinguish with machine learning methods, you can't distinguish one cluster uh, you know, against another, and it should be it should be a single group. Um, so that's one answer. I mean, the the other answer, and um, that really applies to cells and tissues that have been well studied previously, is um, uh, that there are things like cytokines in in the field of of immunology that that are used as as defining markers of the function of a cell. And if they are different between different cells, then the prediction is that those cells would have different functions. So it's a more biological approach to defining um, different cell types or different cell states based on prior knowledge about the expression, the expression patterns in those cells. Thank you. Um, if I can ask a question. Um, I have a question regarding how you said you very quickly responded to the start of the COVID pandemic and collected a great deal of data. And then like, in the end was analyzed by only a handful of people who seemed to be ready to go. Um, how, what, I guess I'm kind of interested in your thoughts on like, what is the place of individual researchers, individual labs, and like, kind of long-term versus long-term collaborative setups that require a degree of permanence in generating good research? 
Mm. Sorry, so I'm struggling to, to understand the, the question. I mean, the I guess the, the sort of time, what you're asking about is the, the, the sort of time scales of projects maybe, and how long. Like yes, so like, or? So like one thing I'm thinking of is like in general in academia, the start of a project is something that can take a very long time if it means like having to get grants or having for people to have to move around. Or it can happen very quickly if you just find some, some interesting side project and spend a few Saturdays on it. Yeah, so different projects take, take different lengths of time. I mean, I think this pandemic was a very, very special situation as I said, um, where, you know, people, people wanted this information to get out as quickly as possible. So this was essentially, the data was collected, analyzed and published in a matter of weeks, right? Because it was, I mean, we wouldn't normally do that. And, um, but, but the, the, there was a special, it was a very special situation and it continues to be a very special situation where the value of rapid sharing is um, highlighted, if that makes sense. Um, Thank you. Yeah. Can I just maybe follow up on the question of uh, sharing and collaborative projects and stuff like that? So obviously, for a project like this, you are dealing with huge amounts of data and potentially also like I mean, imaging is like uh, huge uh, files and huge amounts of data. And then you have transcriptomics on top of that and for multiple cell types and tissues and stuff like that. So I'm just wondering how much of a challenge like the data management strategies become and like how do you uh, deal with that? And also you've mentioned that you've had certain project going on and then because of the pandemic, you've realized that uh, the the other data need to be revisited to just look up for some new features so how do you basically deal with let's say data that were acquired a couple years ago and might be of a different quality compared to the newest and uh, cutting edge technology data and stuff like that so basically what's your take uh, within this project on the big data and uh, data management the, the, strategies the, yeah, the big data and the data analysis is at the heart of the whole project and in fact this project um, was kind of special in the sense that the data coordination platform was the first component that was funded actually. So the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative awarded a grant for this back in, I think it was the end of 2016 or the beginning of 2017. And that was kind of the first part of it was that was funded was actually the data coordination platform, um, which most of the time the data, you know, the data organization is kind of an afterthought here it was right kind of at the heart and at the beginning of the whole project um and that's because uh, you know it's clear that this is a, a huge amount of sequencing data a huge amount of imaging data um it has to be organized in a proper way so that the so that it can be distributed and accessed by people and um and interpreted basically and analyzed So do you have some sort of uh, like uh, standard, like data standard initiative similar to what people developed in the yeah. genomics field? Yeah. So, so, um, yeah. so there, there's uh, metadata uh, is a metadata standards working group and, you know, definition of the metadata is really important and um, definition of uh, the coordinate frameworks for different organs and tissues, definitions of, um, so, so that's one side of it for the actual, like what you're thinking about is the actual organization and deposition of the data and then to access it. And then the other side of it, which I'm kind of really excited about are the, the analysis techniques. And the, there's an analysis working group, um, you know, that's, that's uh, chaired actually by a colleague here in Cambridge, John Marioni, and then uh, a woman in the US, Donna Pear. And, and has a very eminent group of uh, fantastic scientists in it um, to work on analysis techniques, which is also an area that I work in. And it's that, it's the, the flourishing of those techniques that's also um, gone hand in hand with the, the genomics and the, the spatial methods. And, and that's one of the very exciting things about this project for me. Great, thank you very much. <laughs>
Right. Are there any further questions from the audience? Well, if there are no further questions, I think we can bring this talk to a close then. Thank you very much, Dr. Sarah Teichman, for this amazing talk about um, single cell transcriptomics and the human cell atlas. I think it's a, it's a really amazing project and scientists in the future would definitely benefit from this in terms of studying human physiology and various disease states. And thank you all for joining us today. In your generation, it should hopefully be uh, uh, ready to go by then, by the time your, your, your careers are hitting the road. Thank you for having me. It was a pleasure and have a lovely evening. Bye.